Hi, I'm Shelley Wood, the Managing Editor for HeartWire, and my guests here today are Dr. John Chapman, Dr. Keith Fox, and Dr. Ann Gillis. And our topic is guidelines. It's a far-reaching topic, but there's many elements to this that I think are important for practicing physicians and, and of course, the people involved in those guidelines. It's um, quite a bit to tackle, but I thought I'd start with you, Dr. Fox. You yourself have been involved in uh, uh, many of these processes. I sort of thought you could perhaps tell us what you are most proud of, perhaps, in the work you've done, but also tell me about some of the challenges in pulling these things together. Okay, there's a whole lot of challenges, Shelley, but uh, in terms of the guidelines that I think have made a big difference in our field, that's in acute coronary artery disease. Right. And the last 10 years, in fact, the last six years, has seen a substantial decline in cardiovascular mortality and MI complications. And what we've done is we've taken a large-scale international registry and tracked when the guidelines were introduced. And you're talking in Europe, uh, is that right? In the UK? Uh, no, no, international. Okay. Um, our, our program is 104,000 people in, in countries Wonderful. including the US. Okay. So that, that was the GRACE program. We tracked the decline in, t in terms of the timing of the guidelines. And I honestly believe there is an impact. Okay. That's the, the, the pride moment then. What are, what are challenges in terms of putting the, a document like that together? The, the challenge is that unless you have a local champion to take up the guidelines or some sort of reason, some sort of motivation for that, mm -hmm. um, why will somebody take on and implement a new guideline locally even if they feel it's the right thing to do. So this isn't a challenge of putting them together. This is the challenge. The work has been done. How do you get them yeah. into the offices? OK. Well, I do want to come back to that, but let's um, throw the question out to Dr. Gillis. You um, also have been involved in um, a, a number of consensus documents and guidelines, but um, you also believe that there's some difficulties in, in getting some of those groups together. What are those? Well, I think some of the challenges are obviously choosing uh, the, the correct uh, composition for the, the primary guideline panel, and then also um, uh, choosing the appropriate uh, peer review. That is the feedback to the content that's uh, generated. Can you so give us an example of, of how well, that would Well, some of the, the recent, uh, I've been involved with a, a number of different guideline panels, and recently there's been incredible scrutiny about the relationships between physicians and industry. And of course, we want to populate our guideline panels with content experts. Those are the leaders in the field. And because they're leaders, they're most likely to have relationships with industry, whether it's device industry, pharma industry, because right. those companies at present are the ones that are funding a large number of randomized trials that influence uh, the need for new guidelines. Well, physicians need the same expertise, presumably, that the companies do. The person who's, the, who's invented the device is often the one that can teach the physicians how to use it. It's a separate discussion, but it's the, it's the same sort of problem you're, you're speaking to here, I think. That's correct. All right. Uh, Dr. Chapman, there's another element to this. We were talking about it before we uh, started filming here today, but in your experience, uh, pr uh, moments you're proud of as well as challenges, whether it's the um, creating of the guidelines or the implementation of them, where are your thoughts? Well, um, at, at a European level at least, uh, many of us are, are very pleased that um, the joint initiative of the European Society of Cardiology and the European Atherosclerosis Society um, a collaboration over a period of two years with detailed scrutiny and evaluation of the uh, clinical and scientific database we've managed to produce and publish uh, the very first guidelines for prevention uh, of CVD uh, in individuals uh, with atherogenic dyslipidemia. We consider that this uh, is a watershed um, and uh, very recently uh, with the ESC uh, we've uh, made the decision to implement uh, an initiative to disseminate those guidelines uh, to produce as the ESC typically does a user-friendly clinician's handbook right. uh, extracted from the guidelines but perhaps also with additional practical advice and case reports uh, to help in both diagnosis and therapeutic decision making. Um, so we're exceedingly uh, pleased, if you would allow me to say so, uh, to, to have completed this process. It, it has been... But let me jump in because sorry. you said two years to yes. put these together and we'll get back to the implementation moment, but 
Um, two years doesn't sound like very long compared to some of the, the guidelines in the U.S., and perhaps you could speak to Canada as well, but one of the issues here is that some of these, I'm, I'm thinking of the NHLBI guidelines, mm -hmm. we heard at the recent uh, AHA meeting that these, some of these are now, they're not coming out till next year, and that's eight, nine years from the last time these came out. You're talking about having pulled together a document in a two-year period. Uh, one of the concerns I hear is that if it takes too long to put these things together, the information is out of date by the time you get it all in one document. Especially in our field, because things are changing so rapidly. Yeah. Right. And if it's out of date, people w will not actually respect the guideline. No. If one element is out of date, they'll assume that somehow the rest of the document mm. is perhaps tainted yeah. by, uh, by that problem. Well, Shelley, if I, I can leap in in that regard, and my experience with the um, Canadian Cardiovascular Society guidelines process um, we make every effort to bring together guidelines uh, within two years and then these guidelines are considered to be a living uh, guideline where in response to new data we They're update the guidelines updated. annually okay. and uh, right now for instance we presented our atrial fibrillation guidelines um, published them uh, this year in um, uh, January um, they were presented uh, in October 2010, and we're in the process now of meeting to update them in relation but, to but, new but clinical but trials. But that can be a problem, because you chose to update the atrial fibrillation guidelines after one trial. Now, there are other trials yeah. addressing the same topic coming just after, so you're going to have to, have to update them after each one. Um, we're going to uh, try to react and provide physicians with uh, the best information. We're not going to update every recommendation. We're going to review the data and decide areas where recommendations uh, need to be uh, mm -hmm. changed or modified. Yeah. This is uh, Keith raises a critical point here. Uh, what, what should the periodicity of the production mm. of mm -hmm. guidelines be? And we it actually seems there should be some ceremony to it, where you draw a line and then you move and then you draw the line again. But this is a process where there's no line. Yeah. But, but I, I, one of the uh, strengths of the European Society of Cardiology policy is to update guidelines approximately every two years mm. because it's a reasonable period for the evidence base to evolve. Um, I'd just like to make one other point if I could. One of the very important aspects and potentially a distinction from the uh, NCEP ATP4 type mm -hmm. of approach is that the, the um, framework for developing guidelines that was developed by ESC and which we benefited from in our joint uh, task force, uh, we benefited from the fact that there are three evidence levels, grades of evidence. This means that no evidence is excluded. So we have a cascade but of levels. But that could go either way because... Yeah, Shelley, certainly, but I think when you have a group of objective individuals with objective. transparency, objective mm -hmm. as, as, <laughs> as much as they can be, mm -hmm. and that depends on their integrity. And I believe if you accept to become part of a task force for guideline development, there are key principles that you must respect. But we, we, we talked about the industry component here, but there's another level of bias that I think also perhaps isn't this, as much scrutiny paid to it, and that is you've spent your life researching a certain topic you are known in your institution for a certain topic, you're invited to be on a panel because of a certain topic, you, you may not be as open to other ways of, of solving a problem that go against where your research passion lies. I, is that an issue that, that is being well, appropriately managed? Well, that's why the, uh, the composition of the, the guidelines panel has to be diverse and, and represent the, the stakeholders uh, in, involved in, in the topic area um. and, and also should include individuals who, who have no serious conflicts right. you need uh, a mix. with a topic. And, and then the controversy, if there is a controversy, it's debated and hopefully... Oh, it would be so fun to be a journalist in those rooms, I so, think. So, when this so, is so let's take an <laughs> illustration. You know, in the past there were guidelines for percutaneous coronary intervention mm -hmm. that were written by people who were keen to say, to see more percutaneous... A few more stents go in, okay. yes. The new European guideline mm -hmm. uh, that's been done has been done with one, one third of the individuals are experts in the field of percutaneous right. individual. A third are surgeons, 
Mm -hmm. And a third are cardiologists that are non-interventional. Sure, they would be referring it perhaps. For these That's right. Are so, so you've got some balance there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that if somebody has got a, an extreme view, it's going to be counterbalanced mm -hmm. by, by the rest. So in, in the choosing all of these um, uh, unbiased or the right mix of people, is that one aspect? Nobody's unbiased. Well, I, I would agree with you there. <laughs> but, uh, is, that one thi is that one of the factors that is delaying these, some of these from getting out? Is you know, all, the, all the attention being paid to how you get the right people in the room? And then who do you get to then review what those people have come up with? Is, is the time that it takes to do that Presumably, you're all going to tell me it's worth it to get to take the time to choose the right people. Well, I think if you have a process in place that that's efficient, uh, it, it, you should be able to to vet. You 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 make suggestions, you you vet the individuals. You hopefully come up with a, a, a composition of content expert, those uh, who have no major conflicts, mm -hmm. and, and other uh, uh, less vested. Um, individuals who, who can you challenge. come out on average. That's, that's right. You were trying to jump in there too, I think. Well, the, you know, there are certain principles uh, that one must accept when one participates in a guideline panel. I mean, uh, your, the, the knowledge of a given individual and the experience has to be translated in guidelines in such a way that it benefits the, the community in the, lo in the widest possible, possible sense. So. You know the, the sort of uh, agreement that one signs, right. uh, for example, in the framework mm. of, of, of our joint guidelines on dyslipidemia, uh, w we accepted a certain number of critical notions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, the p point that Anne mentioned, it, it, it's obvious that we're going to have people who are at the cutting edge in their domain. Who, who will have had contact with industry, who have intimate contact with ac academia, uh, and so on and so forth, with many different sections of the community, if you will. And surely that is enriching their experience and their viewpoint, if you will, but one must also be as objective as possible. So then I would have to ask, you've all been on that side of the table. Let's think about the physician uh, in, a, in a small town or, or a large city, it doesn't matter, but who is taking this this, this, this product that you, you, you people have put together over many years of consultation and discussion, um, are, do they have the respect for the people that are selected for those committees? Question number one. And, and the other part of it would be, are they using this information that you've spent so long putting together? Dr. Fox? Well, I think the first issue is ensuring, you know, just as, as we've been saying, ensuring that the, the panel is balanced and not going to have an extreme view. But implementation is a really right. big topic. Um, in our country, there are primary care physicians whose shelves groan. With guidelines. With guidelines. I'm sure. They groan with guidelines. It's, they measure them in, uh, you know, in, in <laughs> kilograms and in lengths on the shelf. And not to mention the dust that forms and on the dust top that of forms them on the if they are but, not. But, but, but what makes the difference in them being implemented, I hate to say it, but the, the biggest thing that's made a difference in um, blood pressure assessment, in some of the screening programs, in the cholesterol programs, is the financial incentive. I was going to say the carrot and the stick. It's I think the it's carrot <laughs> and the stick to the primary care physicians to regain some of their income right. by meeting targets. Mm. So that's an appropriate way, is it, to, uh, to reward well, performance? Well, it's, it's controversial, based. it's controversial, but, but actually, you know, we've seen today two examples of the extent of adherence and where the extent of adherence You're was You're going to have to tell us what those are because uh, you, what okay. have we seen today that was... We've seen um, MI Free, mm -hmm. which is a study about uh, uh, support for the co-pays in, in the US. Right. And the main uh, study didn't make a huge difference, but, but the, my concern was um, the extent of adherence was awful. Well, I'm afraid this is going to be a whole different tangent for us, so <laughs> I, I feel sure that interested people on theheart.org will be able to find out more about Am I Free from, from our wonderful news coverage. But at but least come on, the, if, if only 9% well, sure, of because they're taking the key the guideline recommended, yeah. including generic treatments, mm. there is a problem. But in but addition to uh, financial incentives, let's get back to things that we can do to make it easier for the primary care physician 
uh, to implement guidelines. And you're talking about, yes, uh, guidelines committees have often produced 100 plus page documents. Right. We have to distill that down to, to useful Absolutely. Uh, teaching Absolutely. points that, that they can remember and apply every day. So we've created apps where we can, an example mm -hmm. is sure. the CHADS 2 score. There are now apps you can download on your iPhone, on your iPhone or sure. your Blackberry. Okay. Um, the driving guidelines that we've developed uh, for patients with devices, you can download the, those. Mm -hmm. Simple table, very straightforward uh, okay. to use. Those are simple examples. So it's easy, it can... Absolutely. Make it so easy that somebody can go to their phone and follow it through. If a guideline has got 200 pages in it, it's going to get that dust. Failed. Yeah. So the, the take homes here are it needs to be easy, an app would be great, and uh, perhaps having some sort of financial reward tied to the use of it. Controversial, but. Well, mm. uh, it doesn't have to be financial reward, but there has to be some sort of a feedback incentive for people to meet quality control standards, for okay. example. Let's give the final word to uh, Dr. Chapman here. Well, the, there is a, a danger in, in all of this, and that is that we reduce the clinical activities of our colleagues to a numbers game. Yes. And we must be very careful. Clearly, guideline information has to be translated into a user-friendly form which is accessible and can be easily applied. But our opinion is that we should link those guidelines and that guidance, for example, to case reports, uh, to, to the sorts of cases that we discuss Living in examples our staff. that Absolutely. they can recognize. Mm -hmm. so, so that the mm -hmm. clinician can really identify yeah. mm -hmm. with the practical, practical sure. application of the guidelines that we're mm -hmm. producing. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge for us. Yeah. I think we've brushed on so many topics here and perhaps haven't done any of them justice, but it's a fascinating topic and hopefully will be of uh, value to our, our readers and our watchers. So I thank all three of you for joining me here today. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. Pleasure.